everyone. Uh, I feel like I should have a dress and high heels going down that stage, but I'm, I don't. Sorry about that. So we're going to talk about AI, um, a topic that probably many of you have been hearing about already in the past couple of days. But uh, I don't think there's anybody better to get into this topic than Raji. Um, you know, you've heard about Google and Microsoft and Facebook, you know, and their gazillions of dollars put into this. But uh, Raji has a perspective of a startup actually building up an infrastructure and not being one of those, you know, web giants with access to infinite data. So, uh, Sprinkler is the company. Give us a little profile first of what you guys do. So Sprinkler is an enterprise software company in the customer experience management space. What that means is we allow you to do marketing, advertising, customer research, customer care, and customer engagement in 35 social media and messaging channels on one unified platform. And the key differentiator that we bring to the market and to large businesses is that we give them, for the first time, a unified platform across all their customer-facing functions, or their front office, as we call it. And a lot of what you're doing, if, stop me if I've got this wrong, is really monitoring how you're perceived as a company out in the world. Is that right? That's really where it starts. Mm -hmm. um, to be able to intelligently engage with your customers, you have to listen to them. And we have this concept that we call the modern customer, who is very, very different from the traditional customer. And modern customers are not going to respond well if you're talking at them. So you have to engage in a conversation. And as you know, conversations have to start with being a good listener. Exactly. And um, obviously, uh, you have to get a lot of data from various sources. Talk a little bit about uh, what are your data sources. So there's petabytes and petabytes of data out there today that all of us, you know, that we put out. There's 3.8 billion people that are connected online, in most cases with their real identities. And this data that's out there, you know, there's three types of privacy levels to it. One could be me having a private conversation with you that's completely private. Another one could be me having a, a conversation with my friends on Facebook. It's kind of semi-private. And then uh, the third could be me writing a blog or putting a tweet out there, which is totally completely public. open to all 7 billion people. So we start by bringing in all the data that's legally available to you as a company or as an organization. And, and that means all blogs, all forums, Twitter firehose, um, all data that you have access to in semi-private channels. Um, and if you connect your own LinkedIn account, a Facebook account, or Twitter account, then we can bring the private messages that are addressed to you in the mix as well. So that's the main source of the private messages would be something like on LinkedIn? Yeah, only if it's to your own accounts and you authenticate using right. your credentials. So we, companies use us because that allows them to be GDPR compliant and California privacy compliant. It's very, very important, especially if you're in the financial services industry, pharmaceutical industry, like they have compliance needs. Mm -hmm. So you can't just take this data because it's public. You have to respect the fact that this data is owned by the consumer, right. number one, and it's subject to all the regulations and the rules that the owner of that data is gonna put on it, like Facebook or Twitter. So you really have to be compliant at multiple levels if you're gonna use this data. Right. So before we get to how you um, actually use your algorithms against it, how do you annotate it and, and make it useful, all this data you have? Yeah, so you're talking about how do we understand this data and that's the reason why most people can't use this data, because this is unstructured data in 90 languages. This is photos, this is videos that you put out. And it's like walking into this, this hall where everyone's talking to each other. You are gonna listen to you know, hundreds of thousands of conversations that's not gonna make any sense to you. Right. So you really have to bring it in, number one, use artificial intelligence to understand it, and 
once you have models that help you understand sentiment and places and things and intent, to get it right, you have to annotate it and train these models for every industry and for every use case. So we literally have, you know, we've developed models, we, we've taken all open source models, and we literally have hundreds and hundreds of people who are annotating this data all day around the world. Right, and uh, you give a couple of good examples of the context, how one word means one thing in one context. Could you s lay that out? Yeah, sure, a uh, simple example, if you're United Airlines, and someone says, hey, I hate you, United, or United sucks, how do you understand whether you're referring to United as an airline or the word United, right? If you're Microsoft. Or Manchester United. Right? Manchester United. Right. If you're Microsoft, your product names are called Windows and Office, and you have to be able to differentiate when people are talking about your product versus a door or a window. Um, a couple other good examples are common words like the word return. If you, if you say, um, hey, I want to return my product, and you're a retailer, that's a terrible thing. That's a, that's a negative right. sentiment right there. But if I'm in financial services, I'm a bank or an advisor, and someone's using the word return, that could be a good thing. Could so be you, financial return. You have could to be. understand the context. Another one would be, if you're a video gaming company, the word sick could mean, like it's amazing, oh, that game is sick. But if you are in the healthcare industry, sick could mean something. Sick could be different. Okay, so let's take the next step. So you've got the data, you've got, your, uh, you've got it annotated. Um, so just describe the process of, of getting insights from that data. So the first thing we do is we, we suck in data in 90 different languages and we have to understand photos and videos. So we use captions, we read images to understand whether there are people in it, are they smiling, what things are there. We try and get location data so we know where this data is coming from. We know the source of the data. Um, and then what you start doing is breaking these, if it's long form, we have to break it into phrases or frames so you now know what the intent is in each sentence or, su or, or phrase. And then you've got to get subject, object, and verbs. So you're really understanding like human beings do. Um, and then you are using models to find out whether this is a good thing or a bad thing. You're connecting to product catalogs to understand what part of the product are you talking about. If you're, if you're a hospitality company, um, we use algorithms and AI to find out whether you're talking about service, you're talking about rooms or the restaurant or the swimming pool. Then you find out what characteristics are you describing. Are you talking about smell or price or speed? And then we aggregate this using industry models and then score them positive or negative and geocode them so we can queue it up and you can get insights, location insights, you can get product insights. We have data on about 33,000 companies organized by industries and countries. Right. So you can benchmark it, you can detect crisis, um, you can get innovation ideas, you can find customer complaints, you can route it. Right, and so um, let's talk about the hospitality example. Uh, you mentioned smell. <laughs> I just throw that out there. But, but you know, you, you get a bunch of sentiments about smell, you could realize, well, maybe there's a problem in your hotel, right? Right. And then you were talking also about a, a like a public safety kind of a situation. What it would be sort of an alarm type situation that would happen like in a hotel or something like that? Yeah, so we have uh, uh, most large global companies, especially the ones that are digitally savvy, at this point as sprinkler customers. Um, and many of our hospitality clients um, use sprinkler in mission critical ways. And one of those is crisis detection. And we actually had this happen multiple times with our clients where, you know, God forbid there's a shooting or there's a, right. there's a violence somewhere on the property. The difference between picking up that first message quickly and alerting the entire organization versus waiting 10 minutes or five minutes to respond could be the difference between saving you know, a few lives yeah. and, and getting a lot of people insured. What would be the early warning signal in that case? I mean, like a tweet or, or something else? It could be a tweet, it could be uh, an alert, it could be a post. Right. Um, 
but essentially any kind of something that triggers right. the, the, the sprinkler early warning system mm -hmm. that is trained to detect crises. Right. And, and basically that would uh, negative sentiment with any of the fear keywords um, that the model trips on and the volume quickly increasing. Right. So we, we do volumetric alerting. So right. you can say, well, this is not a usual one because we went from went one through. to 22 messages in 13 seconds, which is right. very unusual. Right. So besides the kind of real-time alert uh, crisis management scenario, talk a little bit more about sort of business trend analysis. What business trends is, is very, very, very powerful. First, you want to understand what opportunities do you have to innovate and expand um, I'll give you an example. So McDonald's is one of our customers. And, and as most of you know, uh, a few years ago, McDonald's has been, they were trying to revive their growth. And McDonald's is, was seen as a fast food restaurant that was not very healthy. Um, and so they did focus groups. And the conclusion was, hey, maybe we should offer healthy options. And they right. put salads in stores. And people didn't go to McDonald's to eat salad. So <laughs> that wasn't like, that didn't take off. Right. And when they looked at public data, the voice of the customer, they discovered that people were looking for breakfast items outside of breakfast hours. Ah. Like you go, you're going home from a party at 1 a.m. You're a college kid and like, I'm hungry. I want to have breakfast now. Right. Or you're like showing up at noon and you, you don't want to really have a heavy lunch. You, know, right. you don't want a burger. So you're looking for pancakes or muffins or whatever. And so they found out that tens of thousands of people were looking for breakfast and they got the idea to launch all their breakfast from that. Right. And they validated it by looking at data um, over time. Right. They launched the product and publicly they credit that product launch uh, with reviving you know, like a decline that was running straight for 14 quarters. Right. So you can have like highly impactful um, product innovation ideas. L'Oreal came up with the idea of a high-end travel moisturizer. Mm -hmm. Like you get on a plane right. and you, you can't take your good moisturizing cream with you because right. it doesn't come in travel packet size. Right, right. So if you go to a store and you pick a, a moisturizer that's not high quality and in inside the plane is when you need really high-end moisturizing. Right. As you, as you all know, it gets really dry. So they launched a product that was really successful. They detected something like 267 crisis product alerts uh, last year by listening to the voice of the customer. I think you guys work with Microsoft, uh, is that right? Yeah. Uh, how do they use you? Uh, Microsoft has a very interesting use case. Uh, Microsoft is a company, if you don't know, um, is very focused on engaging with their customers. So uh, in the beginning, when they got started, they were pulling all these messages in and they were manually looking for opportunities to engage. When you see a message or a tweet, you know, someone's got to read through and say, is there an opportunity to respond to right. that? So they literally had scores of people whose job was to read messages and see whether there was an opportunity to respond. Um, and when we launched our Sprinkler AI capability to do that, um, they replaced that team with an automated way to, to identify where the message is engageable. And they were able to use these human resources and people to actually respond to messages. And right. we were able to, by annotating and training using AI, we were able to get to better than human accuracy. Right. Which is you and I looking at a message, we may disagree whether it is <laughs> engageable. Right, right. Um, and so we were able to get better than human accuracy in detecting engageability uh, from a message. There's a case where the person wasn't replaced by the, the, the machine, but he was deployed in a more effective way. Absolutely, which, which I think I'm, I'm not an alarmist. I think AI could be the capitalist that allow us to do the jobs that we enjoy doing. <laughs> Right. And I don't think uh, human beings are going to be replaced completely in some of the things that require cre creativity and higher order intelligence. And what this allows us to do is do the job that we like to do, 
having and have the machines do the job that we don't want to do exactly. all day. Uh, are there any other uh, customers that you want to throw out as uh, good examples? There's, uh, there's uh, plenty of examples. Uh, crisis detection is another one, my favorite. Um, brand detecting um, brand compliance, for example. Uh -huh. So if you're Coca-Cola or you're Microsoft or Nike or any of the big brands, and let's say your brand voice calls for you to be positive or be happy or be nurturing when you put advertising or marketing messages out there. Now, Sprinkler's AI can read messages are you, as you're typing it up before you publish it and tell you whether this message meets all your brand guidelines, whether it's upbeat and it's positive and it's nurturing. And if it's not, you can automatically flag the message and either have the copywriter change it or if it doesn't, automatically send it to a different queue for approval. So there's a lot of people out there who are uh, considering the AI journey, maybe you haven't got too far into it. Um, what are some pieces of advice you would give to those companies? Well, I'd say you have to start taking AI seriously. I know a lot of people who are waiting to kind of see which way it's going, and I think it, it's going to be too late. Uh, every company in every industry that is making AI a strategic driver for the business is going to leapfrog everyone else in that industry. So I'm a big fan of, of what this can do for every industry, every use case. Our business has changed completely. We were one of the first ones to embrace AI wholeheartedly. And we had to do it because we deal with unstructured data, you know, photos and videos and, and text. So there was no way to humanly do it without artificial intelligence. And that's what I would say. So um, how would you, you describe what you can do now? What are some of the futures uh, scenarios here that your, your tech team is working on now? Customer care is, is something that I'm super excited about and what artificial intelligence can do for customer care. We at Sprinkler, we replaced all our customer care uh, products with Sprinkler and turned on our artificial intelligence. And we were able to reduce the time to resolve an issue, resolve uh -huh. by 80%. Right. And that's primarily because uh, a complaint coming in, a ticket coming in is automatically analyzed, associated with the product. We're able to look up inside of our software repository connected to developers, get that message to the person who can fix it a lot faster than we traditionally could do. Because traditionally we were using customer care, level one, six hours later, level two, 12 hours later, level three. Right. And if would, it was a code problem, it was, we were using Slack to find a developer, which was taking days. <laughs> And now you know exactly who is the person who can fix it. You're getting that message to that developer the same time as support is getting on it. Exactly. Yeah, I can imagine you might even be telling the customer he has a problem. Yeah. Absolutely. Exactly. Well, we've come to the end of our, our time here. I hope you'll thank Raji for his expertise in this area. Thank you. Thanks.